Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode one of 247 Spin. I'm your host, Dave Williams. Our story begins with a man named Sir Vivian Bunny Fuchs, British explorer and geologist, and unofficially the world's most renowned pipe smoker. Fuchs got his nickname Bunny while in boarding school, uh, presumably before his pipe smoking days began, but who knows. In 1957 and 58, with much logistical help from Mount Everest conquering hero, Sir Edmund Hillary, Vivian Fuchs led the Commonwealth Trans-Antarctic Expedition over 2,100 miles from the Filchner Ice Shelf to McMurdo Sound, across what was calculated to be the South Pole. Born in 1908 on the Isle of Wight, England, Fuchs attended Brighton College and later Cambridge University, where he received his PhD in geology in 1935. His expeditions took him throughout the world, including to the Aldivai Gorge in Africa, where he spent some time with Dr. Lewis Leakey, who was there digging up bones trying to prove Darwin's theory of evolution. Here's Fuchs with his triumphant team at Scott Base after the Transantarctic Expedition in 1958. This is Bunny here taking a knee. Behind him is Billy Moss, British SOE, whose claim to fame was kidnapping a Nazi general on the island of Crete during World War II and then stealing him away to Cairo. Good guy to have around. Sir Edmund Hillary here. And this fellow who just wants the photographer to snap the pictures so they can all go inside. Antarctica is the coldest place on Earth. The lowest temperature ever recorded there was at Vostok Station in 1983, where the thermometer dipped to minus 128.6 Fahrenheit. With that kind of environmental threat to Fuchs's team, it's easy to understand why the planning for the expedition took six years. Aside from the threats of frostbite or freezing to death, this was one very long and extremely treacherous tractor ride across an icy, unforgiving land. Hundreds of deep crevasses had to be crossed, a slow, painstaking process that required manual probing of the route. Day after day, mile after mile, from the Weddell Sea to the Ross Sea, across the Antarctic Peninsula. The expedition team moved forward, finally reaching Scott Base on March 2, 1958, 99 days and 2,158 miles after departure from Shackleton Base. Queen Elizabeth II was so impressed with Fuchs's accomplishment that she knighted him even before he'd returned to England. Most people believe that Antarctica is the southernmost continent on the bottom of a heliocentric globe. However, there's a rapidly growing number of people who contend that Antarctica is simply the icy shoreline of our flat earthly realm that God created for us. Whatever your view of Earth geology happens to be, without question, Antarctica is shrouded in mystery. No one can go there except on government sanctioned trips under military guard. This high level of security is a foundational element of the Antarctica Treaty signed in 1959 by the 12 original nation members, which included, among others, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union. As of 2023, there are 56 parties within the Antarctica Treaty system, and that system works nonstop to maintain absolute control of everything out past the 60th parallel. So what is the history behind the man who first transversed Antarctica? By his own admission, Vivian Fuchs knew very little about his German ancestors. And after a lengthy search for historical records on his people there in Deutschland, I share Bunny's lack of knowledge. Vivian's father, Ernst Fuchs, known as Ernest in England, was an immigrant farmer from Kala, Germany. His mother was Violet Watson, an English woman whose historical past while readily more available, is not without its own share of mystery. Violet met Ernest at a health spa while vacationing in Germany, and suffice it to say that things got quite steamy between them there in the bathhouse. They were married in Dover, England in 1907. He was 25, she was 33. And seven months later, they were welcoming a bouncing baby bunny. That societal miscue of conceiving a child out of wedlock infuriated Violet's father, Charles, so much so that he banished her from his home. We'll touch on that a bit later. 
Bunny's German grandfather, Wilhelm Gottwerth Friedrich Fuchs, was also born in Kala, which is the home of the 800-year-old Luchtenberg Castle. We're told that Wilhelm Fuchs was an artist, specifically a painter, but for the life of me, I couldn't find one single painting attributed to this man. Maybe he truly was a starving artist, much to the chagrin of his poor wife, Johanna, Bunny's grandmother. What is known about the Fuchs family is that the German name Fuchs, in addition to being butchered profanely, translates to fox in English. When Bunny's mother, Violet, was six years old, she had a terrible accident while running through her home in Norwood, Kent, with a guest of the family. So severe was the injury to her back that she was bedridden for two years and walked with a limp the rest of her life. But in spite of her physical disability, by all accounts, she was a happy person who worked hard and rarely complained. Here's an excerpt from her later writings where she recalls playing as a child on the grounds of the Kingsland estate. One other haunt I had a group of three or four fir trees at the top of the long path, which I called my fir house. By lifting aside one of the great fan branches which swept the earth, I could step into a concealed and roomy dwelling roofed with broad branches and carpeted deeply with dry fir needles. No plants grew there except a single straggling violet, my namesake. It was a wonderful garden for varied joys. Violet's father, Charles Watson, was born in Lancashire, England in 1827. He made his fortune in the wholesale grocery business, supplying foodstuffs to miners during the gold rush in Australia, which began in the early 1850s. His first wife was Mary Nairn, who died in 1867 at the age of 51. The best way to introduce Violet's mother, Charles' second wife, is by reading Violet's first memory of her upon their reunion at the Langham Hotel after her parents had returned from Australia. Amazingly, this exquisite old world hotel is still in operation today. Just look at that structure. They just do not build things like that today. Now the context here is that Violet really only knew the rustic life she had with her paternal grandparents while she was in Scotland. Anne, my nurse, and I stood in the hall and looked up a very big staircase, a staircase of the giants, down which all sorts of people were coming. Presently, I saw a queen coming down. She was young and slender and tall, not a bit like the Gibb family in figure, and she had a big crown of bright golden hair. Her dress was pink, embroidered all over with pearls. Her neck and arms were bare. She was rosy and smiling and came so gaily down from far up the stair. I could only gaze at her in rapture. My sister Minnie pointed to her and said to me, here comes your mama. I was taken aback because I thought a mama was stout and old and gray. It was glorious but frightening to have a mama like this and to have her fling her arms around me and eat me up with kisses. I did not speak a word, nor all that evening, in a great sitting room with green velvet curtains, did I utter a single sound in answer to all the coaxings of mother. That queen in the pearl-studded pink dress coming down the staircase of the giants was Ellen Blackall. Charles married Ellen on October 13th, 1870, in Australia. He was 43, she was 20. Not unusual for the day and age, I suppose. Kind of like Ellen being born in an insane asylum. No big deal. When Violet was five years old, the family moved into Kingsland. We're told that the home was built in 1877 by Dr. W.S. Black, who, according to Violet, had to move out two years after its completion because he'd spent all his money making improvements to the lavish villa. As remarkable as that story may be, history has not remarked on Dr. W.S. Black, either as a doctor or a master builder capable of constructing a 15-room medieval-style stone mansion. This massive home featured a 30-foot-long dining room with parquet wooden floor, a grand lanthorn with stained glass panels, tessellated marble floors on the ground level, and the list goes on. Here we see a layout of the grounds at Kingsland, 
and the wonderful garden where Violet played and hid away from the outside world. When Violet was 12 years old, the Watsons moved out of Kingsland and into this modest little place, Pembury Inn. We're told that this medieval marvel was built by Violet's father, Charles, and this is where both he and his wife, Ellen, died. In May of 1907, Charles Watson threw his pregnant, handicapped daughter, Violet, out of Pembury Inn because of her indiscretion with Ernest, who by this time had gone to Genoa, Italy, where he had a job. Dejected and fearful of what her future might be, Violet fled to the Isle of Wight, where she stayed at Recluse Lodge in Freshwater with her old nurse, Harriet Moray. It was there on February 11, 1908, that Vivian was born. Reunited by Vivian's birth, Ernest and Violet moved with their young child to Staplehurst in the Weald of Kent. There, with financial help from Violet's maternal cousins, the Connells, they bought seven acres of land on which Ernest built this beautiful country home called Walden. What I find interesting is, is that no matter what your occupation was during the Victorian era, apparently every man's calling was that of a master builder. <laughs> the family was happy at Walden. Ernest farmed and raised pigs and chickens. Violet tended her garden and young Vivian did chores and went on his first expeditions into this small part of the world. But their happiness was shattered with the outbreak of World War I in 1914 and England's declaration of war on Germany on August 4th of that year. Ernest was arrested on October 26, 1914 and sent to Camp 2 at Newbury, an internment camp with deplorable conditions where thousands of German immigrants were sent simply because of their German origin. Thankfully, after only two months, he was let out on a surety payment guarantee by a family friend on the Isle of Wight. However, six months later, Ernest was again taken into custody and this time sent to Nokolo, a camp on the Isle of Man with considerably better conditions than Newbury. He spent two full years at Nokolo and was eventually freed on a work release in late spring of 1917, having been hired as a gardener for Violet's cousin, Tom Connell, at Connell's Elmstead Woods estate back in Kent. As happy as Violet was to have Ernest home, she was saddened by the death of both her parents in 1917. First her mother Ellen in August at age 67, then her father Charles in October at age 90. As Charles grew senile in his old age, he forgot all about the banishment of his daughter and actually enjoyed having Violet by his side. Unfortunately, the English government of that day was not as forgiving. When Charles died without a will, and because Violet was married to a German immigrant, her inheritance was withheld from her by the state. For the next 10 years, the family fought through a myriad of legal and bureaucratic obstacles, and it wasn't until 1927 that the inheritance assets were finally released to her. In 1917, at the age of nine, Vivian was sent to Ashton Preparatory School near Tenterton. It was there that young Vivian was first called Bunny. I have no idea how he got that nickname. Maybe it was because he was the head boy and his classmates teased him about being the headmaster's pet. Who knows? Ashton doesn't look like the cheeriest of boarding schools. In fact, uh, it looks kind of creepy. But Vivian recalled that he was not unhappy during his time there, and he had good things to say about his headmaster, H.F.F. Varley. In his autobiography, A Time to Speak, Bunny describes Varley as a splendid man with a pointed beard, a curled mustache, and a liberal outlook who managed to instill interest and enthusiasm into small boys. I'm sorry, folks, but this looks more like a place of torture than a gymnasium, at least a soft dungeon. Check out these straps. In their leisure time, the boys could gather in the hall to read, maybe play some billiards, all under the watchful eye of this goat-legged creature. A quick review of our Greek mythology has this horny fellow as a satyr, a male nature spirit who's often seen out partying with Dionysus, the god of wine. Satyrs are lewd, sex-starved creatures that are often portrayed with large erections. <laughs> I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, that's perfect for a boys' prep school. 
1926, Vivian attended St. John's College, Cambridge, where he was tutored by James Mann Wordy, who was a senior science officer on Sir Ernest Shackleton's ill-fated Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition of 1914. Is it any wonder that Fuchs was destined to become an Antarctic legend under that level of tutelage? Here among Wordy's achievements is the nurturing of a new generation of young explorers, including Vivian Fuchs and Gino Watkins. Gino Watkins was an accomplished Arctic explorer and won prestigious awards from the Royal Geographical Society for his discoveries in Greenland. Coincidentally, Watkins had attempted to organize an Antarctic crossing of his own in 1932, but a lack of resources during the Great Depression prevented him from doing so. Instead, that same year, Watkins went back to southeastern Greenland. On the morning of August 20th, he set out on his own to do some seal hunting, but he didn't return. Later that day, his colleagues found his empty kayak floating upside down in Tudelik Fjord. His body was never found. In 1933, Vivian Fuchs married his second cousin, Joyce Connell. Not unusual for those times, especially among families in high society. Here's Joyce Fuchs in 1958 being honored, along with Sir Edmund Hillary's wife, Louise, at a reception for wives of the members of the Commonwealth Trans-Antarctic Expedition. Joyce was the granddaughter of John Connell, the business partner of Charles Watson, and great-granddaughter of Thomas Blackall, Bunny's great-grandfather. I hope you're all keeping up with these relationships because there will be a test later. The wealth that afforded Violet's family financial security for most of her life originated from the aforementioned Australian gold rush of 1851 and the close partnership of John Connell and Charles Watson who made their fortune selling food and liquor to the mining camps. Here's the case of a couple of shrewd Scotsmen who found a way to build wealth simply by addressing an immediate material need and doing so in great volume. To put those numbers into perspective, during the gold rush days between 1851 and 1871, Australia's population went from 430,000 to 1.7 million, nearly a fourfold increase. Vivian and Joyce Fuchs had three children, a daughter Hillary born in 1936, a daughter Rosalind born in 1938, and a son Peter born in 1940. Their middle child, Rosalind, died of cerebral palsy in 1945 when she was eight years old. There isn't much public information on any of the Fuchs' children, and considering that their father was the first person in history to complete a transantarctic crossing, I find that rather astonishing. I contend that either the Fuchs children were very reclusive, or there's something about the children that's being withheld from the public. But I will leave that there for you, the viewers, to consider. There could be other reasons for the mysterious lack of historical record on these children, so please leave your ideas in the comment section. By the time Vivian Fuchs had joined the Army Reserve in 1938, the shadowy bankers of the world were once again setting the stage for another war. From 1942 to 1944, Fuchs served on the Gold Coast of West Africa before taking a civil affairs post at the Second Army Headquarters in London. During D-Day, he was serving at Portsmouth, far from the bloody beaches of Normandy. However, he did eventually make it to Germany and witnessed the liberation of the Nazi concentration camp, Bergen-Belsen. Here we see women and children being held together in one of the camp huts shortly after help had arrived. Much too busy to get in touch with his German roots, Fuchs served as Allied Forces occupational governor in Northern Germany before being discharged from the military with the rank of major. Overall, it appears that Fuchs got around quite a bit during the war years and managed to come through it all unscathed. I come away from this part of the story with the impression that there must have been an unseen hand guiding Vivian Fuchs pushing him onward to greater glory, to a crowning achievement for which he'd already been ordained long before he set foot on the icy shores of Antarctica. Sir Vivian's wife Joyce died in 1990, and a year later he married Eleanor Honeywell, who had been Fuchs's longtime secretary at the British Antarctic Survey, while he was that organization's director from 1958 to 1973. Eleanor Honeywell's first husband, 
was Royal Navy Captain Richard Honeywell, who died of cancer in 1972. Before he died, he had asked Sir Vivian to keep an eye on Eleanor's future welfare, a promise Fuchs most certainly did keep. Each year, the British Antarctic Survey awards the Fuchs Medal, of which Vivian's second wife, Eleanor, was a recipient, and the first, of course, being Vivian himself. After my research for this presentation, I come away with one overarching thought, and it is this. So much of the information about people in British royal society, or even those who have brushed against the regalia of crowned authority in a meaningful way, is either hidden away from the public or erased from history altogether. Why should such remarkable people and their family origins be shrouded in such secrecy? It may very well be that many of the human aspects of this story are lost in the vastness of an age-old mystery, frozen somewhere below the icy depths of royal pomp and circumstance, where, like the deep reaches of Antarctica itself, nobody is allowed to go. Not nobody, not know-how.